Right, today we're going to take our idea of the atom and we're going to go just a little bit farther with it. Uh, yesterday we said that a collection of atoms with the same number of protons make up an element. And we talked about the different kinds of isotopes that are going to be involved in each element of an atom. But we can also take those atoms and we can bond them together. And when we bond atoms together, we form molecules. Now there are two different types of molecules. One type of molecule is one where you have all of the same type of atoms. So for example, um, if I have um, two oxygen atoms that are stuck together, that are bonded together, um, that is O2, and that's how I represent that, to say that I have two oxygen atoms that are, that are bonded together. And in fact, uh, you're hardly ever going to find an oxygen atom that is just kind of be bopping around by itself. All of the oxygen that we inhale that's in the air around us is in the form of O2. It's always got two oxygen atoms that are bonded with each other. Hydrogen is another uh, very common element that is in the air around us. And it is also always two atoms that are bonded together. So H2. Nitrogen is the biggest component of the air around us that we breathe. And nitrogen also has always two atoms bonded to each other. You're not gonna have any single atoms of nitrogen. They're always gonna be bonded to each other. So some molecules are made up of the same type of atoms, but many, many, many molecules are made up of different types of atoms. And that is how we can have so many different kinds of matter on Earth because if we could only bond the same types of atoms together, we'd only have, what, maybe 110 or so different types of, of matter, but we know that we have many, many more than that, and that's because different types of atoms can bond um, to each other. If this happens, if I have different types of atoms bonded together, I have what is called a compound. And compounds are, can be something as simple as H2O, which you know as water. So when, what does H2O mean? Well, what that means is that I have two hydrogen atoms and I have one oxygen atom. And so all together, I'm gonna to have three atoms in this particular uh, molecule. Even though I don't have a one written here, uh, I don't write the one uh, just because chemists tend to be kind of lazy and like, well, if I don't write the one, that means there's just one. Otherwise, if there's something beyond one, then I'm gonna write it, okay? Um, another example is CO2 carbon dioxide, the air that you breathe out all of the time as, as waste. So in carbon dioxide, there's no subscript here, so you're gonna have one carbon atom and you're gonna have two oxygen atoms. Uh, once again, uh, we're gonna have a total of three atoms in a molecule of carbon dioxide. How about NH3? NH3 is a molecule of ammonia. Um, you can dissolve ammonia in water. In fact, there's, you're going to find ammonia in a lot of your uh, cleaning solutions that you use around the house. Window cleaner especially uh, tends to have ammonia in it. So what is a molecule, molecule of ammonia made up of? Well, that N is nitrogen, so it's going to have one nitrogen atom and it's going to have three hydrogen atoms in it for a total of four atoms in that molecule. Um, here's another one. CH4, uh, methane. You've, you may have heard um, some different things about methane because it's one of those um, different types of waste gases that is produced. And some people are really, perhaps even a little overly concerned about the amount of methane that gets, that gets put out. But a molecule of methane has one carbon and it has four hydrogens. And so it has a total of five atoms in it. Um, a couple of things to understand about these chemical formulas. Um, one is that even though everything I showed you here has a very, very small number of atoms in it, we can have molecules that are just absolutely ginormous that can even have up to hundreds of atoms in them. And we'll talk about some of those molecules later on that are just really, really, really large. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that if the chemical formula is different, 
then that means that there are very, very different properties of those two things. So here, carbon dioxide, we know that, um, hopefully you know that plants um, produce carbon um, dioxide, we produce carbon dioxide, they take in carbon dioxide, I said that backwards, they take in carbon dioxide um, to help them make, to run photosynthesis and make the sugar that they need. But there's another um, molecule that looks kind of similar and it's this one. This is carbon dioxide because it has two oxygens. This is carbon monoxide because it just has one oxygen in it. Now both of these have carbon and both of them have oxygen, but the difference is that if you inhale carbon monoxide, that can kill you. Carbon dioxide is in the air all around us and um, yeah, we are going to inhale it. If we happen to inhale it, we're gonna breathe it right back out again and it doesn't hurt us. But carbon monoxide is, can be very, very lethal to us. Um, and so if you have different molecules, different uh, formulas for these, that means they are different compounds and they have completely different properties to them. So we talked about the fact that these um, molecules are, are bonded together, but what does that mean that they're bonded together? The author of your textbook talks about two different kinds of bonds. She talks about um, covalent bonding and they, she talks about ionic bonding. Now, what does that mean? I'm going to explain it to you so that hopefully it makes some sense, but this is not something that um, at this stage of the game um, that I expect you to know. When you take chemistry next year, we will talk a lot about bonding and why certain things bond certain ways and how we can tell what kind of bond it is. Um, for right now, um, I'm just gonna try to explain the, the very basics to you. So the outer shell of the electrons that, um, that we talked about yesterday, when we talked about the structure of the atom, atoms are much more stable if that outer shell can be completely full. And most of the atoms that we are going to be talking about, the, um, the Chanops atoms, they are most stable and therefore most happy when they can have a total of eight electrons in their outer shell. And so to achieve that magic number of eight, they will do one of two things. They will either share some electrons with another atom so that they can get up to eight, or they will actually transfer electrons back and forth. So as an example, um, a sodium ion has several different shells of electrons, but its outermost shell, it just has one electron. Chlorine, on the other hand, uh, again, has several shells of electrons, but its outermost one has seven. So it, this one wants one more, and this one really has almost one too many so that their outer shell can have just eight electrons. So the sodium will transfer its electron to the sodium or to the chlorine. And if you remember that electrons have a negative charge, when this sodium gives up its extra electron, this has gained a negative charge. So it now has um, a negative charge on it. The sodium, since it's given up a negative charge, now has a positive charge on it. And this is what I was talking about the other day. These guys are now called ions because they don't have equal numbers of protons and electrons anymore. They've given up electrons or they've accepted electrons in order to get that nice, full, stable outer shell. And then what happens is that because you know that positive charges and negative charges attract one another, the positive, positively charged sodium and the negatively charged chlorine kind of stick together, kind of like, you can almost think of it like magnets. It's not the same type of attraction, but it's similar, an electric attraction between a positive and a negative charge. This is called an ionic bond because these guys have shared, I'm sorry, these guys have transferred electrons. Covalent bonding is when they share their electrons to get that full outer shell. And again, this is one of those things that I don't expect you to understand all the nitty gritty things about bonding. Um, basically, if you understand that bonding is when atoms hook together to each other, I'm going to be happy with that. I'm not going to expect you to understand the difference between covalent and ionic. In fact, I think I even told you, don't even worry about writing down definitions for those. I mention it um, 
basically so that you can understand a discussion that we're going to have tomorrow about um, polarity of, of water and some of the reasons water behaves why it does, but you don't need to understand all this nitty gritty about um, covalent and ionic bonding. Now, with that being said, there's one other thing that I wanna point out to you. On page um, 44 of your book, on this side right here, um, the author has a number of different molecules drawn out for you. And she has things like um, the oxygen that we talked about, the carbon dioxide that we talked about, um, the methane. I mean, she has a lot of these same molecules that we have already talked about. The pictures that are in there are not all correct. Um, what is possible is that sometimes when atoms bond to each other, sometimes um, they make just a single bond where maybe they're sharing one pair of electrons, but sometimes they share two pairs of electrons or even three pairs of electrons with each other to try and get that outer shell of electrons full. And if that happens, if they're sharing more than one pair of electrons, then the bond becomes a double bond or even a triple bond. And so the oxygen that she has shown on there that in the drawing looks like two balls with a stick between them that look, looks like that, that's actually not accurate because oxygen atoms, when they bond together, actually have two bonds. They have a double bond between them. And so oxygen actually looks more like this. Um, she has nitrogen on there. And again, she depicted nitrogen the same way, but in reality, um, two nitrogen atoms are each going to share three pairs of electrons with each other. So nitrogen actually is going to look like that. It's going to have three bonds in between it. Um, her drawing for carbon uh, monoxide and carbon dioxide are also off. And you're not going to be tested over that. I don't expect you to know it. But if you happen to come across some pictures in another place, or if you see them later, and for some reason that picture has stuck in your head, I just wanted you to be aware that some of the pictures on in that drawing are not correct. Um, so oxygen, the nitrogen is incorrect. I'm gonna go ahead and put the others up here just so that you know. Carbon dioxide um, looks like this. It has two double bonds um, to each of the, of the carbon with the oxygen on either side. And then the ozone molecule that she has there, the ozone molecule actually is double bonded to one oxygen and it's singly bonded to another. Okay, again, not something that I expect you to know. I just wanted you to be aware that there is a mistake in your textbook and I didn't want you to, to then take that as gospel accuracy and then look at something else and go, oh, that's wrong when in actuality uh, what's in the textbook is wrong. So I wanted you to be aware of that. So. Big takeaway from today, what do you need to remember? So what you need to remember is that groups of atoms are elements, but atoms that are bonded together are molecules. Molecules can, can be bonded with the same type of atoms, or they can be bonded with different types of atoms to form compounds. You need to be able to look at the formula for a compound and tell me how many of each atom are in it and how many total atoms are in the whole molecule. Okay, so really that's, that's what you need to understand and you need to understand that an ion is formed if there is a transfer of electrons from one atom to another that is going to enable their bonding. So those are the big ideas from today and I look forward to talking to you again tomorrow.